Welcome back to Nick Lynch's Movie Reviews, episode number 65. Yeah, I made a typo with the last couple videos, so the previous two videos, the previous one is 64, and the one before that is 63. Yep. With this one, we're reviewing the eighth Star Trek film ever released, First Contact, which is by far, for a lot of people, the best film of the four Next Generation films. Coming out in the year of... 1996, and believe it or not, I actually saw this film in theaters. First Star Trek I ever did. I actually missed the next one. I did see Nemesis from that point forward. I did see the rest of the films in theaters. I was eight years old, and this movie scared me. I didn't watch this film after it initially came out for ten years, and then when I got older, I watched it like okay, I was scared of basically nothing. Uh huh. Yep, scared of basically nothing. Yep. This film was released the same year as another famous Roland Emmerich film, Independence Day, which gets still uh, get a lot of flack today for how much weird and bizarre this film is. Yeah. Now, in the case of this particular film, I mean, aside from releasing the Independence Day, this is the first film directed by Jonathan Frankie's first of three movies he's ever directed. Three! Yeah, only three. I'm like... Really? You only directed three films? Two Star Trek films and another film called Clock Stoppers? Yes, which is also, believe it or not, Michael Bean's last known film appearance. Yeah, though he's still alive. He hasn't acted film since then. Yep. Let's see, what else? It's the first and only film to feature the Borg. Yep. And with the Borg being in the film, we get new looks for them. It's of the black leather looks with little wires mismatched. Yeah, the simulation is a lot more gruesome in this film than they are in the in the original Next Generation show. And also, we have a Borg Queen. A subject that's really mixed for a lot of people. Played by Alice Krug. Wonderfully by her. A lovely woman for her age. And she's a, she's an actress from South Africa, believe it or not. <laughs> and this is first of two times she does play her. After this, she has not played this character ever again until the final episode of Star Trek Voyage Endgame. Which, I actually watched this film, I actually watched the episode live when it aired back in 2001. Yeah, I'm not kidding about that. That seriously is true. I did watch the episode here, and that was a return because previously in that series, the Borg Queen was played by Susanna Thompson. Who's recently known for being on the show Arrow as the mother, as playing Mora Queen, the, the mother of Oliver Queen on Arrow. Of course, this film not only is the first, is the only film featured the Borg, it's also the film debut of the Star, the USS Enterprise E. Yeah, this is what the ship looks like. First of three films this, this ship appears in. With this ship, you get many stuff associated with this particular ship, uh, like with the last ship, appear in this particular film. You see the bridge. A very, very modern looking bridge. Though, the stations they actually have for some of the characters are actually a little bit smaller. Some are scattered, like, like the, the council is still over to the captain's left, in a way. But, it's, it's a lot more big of a bridge, and there's a lot more consoles in this one. And, the weapon station is smaller than it is in on the Enterprise D. We see Sick Bay, we see the holodeck. And, this is by far the only film the holodeck actually is a comparison, because it doesn't appear in the next two films, surprisingly. No, it doesn't. I'm like, really? You bring all that in for this one, we don't bring it back? Okay. Engineering pops up in here. The captain's ready room pops up in here. And trying to think, what are what are, what other thing? Like, as far as I can tell, I don't think we see anybody's quarters on this on this. Oh yes, the the ready the the meeting room that pops up in here as well. Though it does change in Nemesis, they they, they do change slightly in Nemesis. The ready room the the meeting room this one is basically the long table like usual. The, the window which has stars go across this, uh, across this space. And on the other side, now behind Picard, usually there's a screen. That's the way it was in the show. This one, there is, but it's not used. Nope. To, behind the, most of the officers is a long wall of all the previous Enterprise ships. From the original Constitution class up until Enterprise D. Every single one is there in these golden ship models. Mm-hmm. Now, I should point out, though, uh, in the, on the Enterprise D, in the, ca in the captain's ready room, there was a model of the Stargazer. 
Picard's first command. This film doesn't have that for some reason. Yes, there's no explanation of why the, the Stargazer model is not there, but yeah, the rest of them don't have it. So, yeah. And of course, no, the fishbowl does not show up in this film at all. It's a nice looking desk. And apparently, the way that the way you first see it, it's particularly very bizarre. It happens like right at the start of the film. Like you have Picard during the best of both worlds, so possibly some see footage, but but this actually recorded during the course of the film. Him in his next generation is uh in his uniform he wore next generation. And he's going through a simulation and he wakes up, like he possibly sitting in the chair, and he just puts water on his face. Yeah, sink they have a sink full of water on his face. And then a board thing pops up and he wakes up in his office. And this is when we first see in this scene, the the brand new uniforms they wear from for this film and the following two films, and also the definitive uniform they wear on D Space Nine, which is basically all black, all black bottom, like from from like basically your shoulders, uh, from the edge of the shoulders downwards, all black. the The shoulders are blue. The the combat actually changed as well. Yes, the combat changed because. On Next Generation, it was basically the 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 arrow thing that normally there, plus like little circles. This one actually they transformed with the arrow. They actually sort of made it a little bigger, and they put like little like mag they look like look, they look like magnets on the sides. And this was definitive combat for pretty much the rest of the franchise up until Enterprise. And of course, to signify what branch of of the part of Starfleet, the part of like for engineering, it's actually on, believe it or not, their sleeves. Yes, it's not like up here like it was before. It's basically like on their sleeves. That's the same if someone's basically in command, engineering, or even medical or science. Basically, it's on their, basically part of their sleeves basically is their wrist. That's basically where it is. And their, 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 let's say their buttons for their promotion there's actually another undershirt underneath, just like the previous uniform did, and that's where all the that's where all of the things are. And also with this uniform, they brought back the belt buckles. Yes, they don't show up in this film per se. They show up in the next one when the admirals have them now. Yes, all the admirals have got big buckles, big belts with their uniforms. This one doesn't have this. Basically, it, when you look at it, it looks like a it looks like a jumpsuit. That's pretty much the design of this suit. It's probably more feasible that they look like this, and plus. If you notice in the previous film, you probably notice basically you have characters basically pulling down their shirts a lot. This was something from what I've heard was a way to reduce wrinkles, which a lot of people refer to as, as a Picard maneuver, though there is a Picard maneuver on the show. And the reason why they switched uniforms was because, and this is actually there's a, this is actually a true story. The reason they switched uniforms from the well, the ones they traditionally when they show the big like red on the chest and the back. They actually had like little lines like on the sleeve, on the on the shoulders. The reason why I switched from, from the skin tight ones to the ones that I'm not wearing when they pulled down the tops. The reason why that was was because that Patrick Stewart was having back problems. So they replaced everybody's uniform, so it took a while to take a full effect. Mm -hmm. With this with this uniform, there's no need for that at all. Nope. And apparently it looked like that the uniform was so comfortable on the actors. They wear it a lot of the whole time. You never see them actually change out of the uniforms at all. Like the whole time. Well, you do see like one of the basic looks up, they look like a jacket per se. Like open it up. But if we look at it, it looks like a jumpsuit. That's basically what it looks like. Though we can, the top can come off of it. Yep, that's what it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. The ready room looks a little different than the Enterprise... D. One thing is not like an extra little office thing on the side, possibly for the replicator. Yeah, they don't have this one, and the chair looks a, a lot different than it did. You know, it looks like it was very red with a little gold around the edge. And apparently, excuse me, the the their computer that's on their desk basically pops up now, like a laptop. I'm not sure why they did this for, but my guess is because laptops are, were starting to become a thing in the 90s, so they had the thing do this. Engineering, you don't get a good look at it until the next film, so I'm not going to talk about it here. Sick Bay looks, uh, looks mostly, it's more like, it's basically a modern update what it did on the Enterprise D. Yep. And I should point out, though, 
that Picard got this ship like rough like a couple years prior to the events of the film. And as of currently, he's been commanding this ship for about 15 years. Yeah, a long time as the most recent novel release. He's been commissioned for a long time. It's not been destroyed. It's still active. Yep. And, of course, you don't have the scene where Picard's getting debris from the ca- from the Admiral. Yeah, it's basically like, yeah, Connor was destroyed. Like, you know, the Borg is coming. And the self neutral zone. Yep. And this is also a thing during the mini war. Apparently, the Enterprise was not allowed to participate in the fighting. Which I'm like, Starfleet, are you that damn stupid? You won't allow one of your best ships to participate in the fighting for the mini war. Apparently, from what I heard, that the reason why that it wasn't participate in the mini war was because of they wanted to prevent the Gorn from taking sides in the war. That's basically what they were doing during the war. Yeah, as for some neutral zone. It's the first of two times in the film where they went to the neutral zone. This film and Nemesis, though Nemesis, they actually get a reason for that. Yeah, in this film, it's like, okay, so they course for neutral zone. And they pretty much do nothing but basically tech comets. Yeah. A lot of, like, the way, the way Riker basically does this, and of course, when Riker comes into Picard's, I think it's his quarters. I th- yeah, I think it's his quarters. You don't see much, much, much of this film, and he's playing music in this particular scene, and he's like, "We fin- finished our first essentially neutral zone." Yeah, gaseous anomalies and a class two comet. Well, this is worthy of our attention. Yeah, it seems like Picard is like very disappointed. It's like nothing, and according to data in the previous scene, he says, "There's been no activity across the Romulan for nine months." So why? Were they sent there? Because an admiral, with a very stupid opinion, mind you. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people watch them think this admiral's really stupid. It's like, okay, they have all confidence in the ship and the crew. They're not confident in their captain. They think someone who was captured and assimilated by the Borg would produce an unstable element to a crucial situation. And Riker points out, that's stupid. Really stupid. You probably need somebody who knows, who has full first-hand experience of the Borg, and you put him on the sidelines? That's really stupid. And, of course, they open communication, and then they go, and they hear what's going on, they go, well, prior to this, they go straight to Earth. Like, they hear, like, the big battle's like, they cut off, like, and, of course, <laughs> and Picard's like, set a course for Earth. Maximum warp. If anybody, and he's like, if anybody objects, I'll, I'll be sure no for my log. <laughs> yeah, of course he's like, horrors can go straight to hell, and they go straight to Earth. And there's this great cinematography shot of the board cube going cr- sweeping across the camera, which I do agree with the opinion this film should be nominated for, for Best Cinematography. But instead it was nominated for Best Makeup, which was stupid. The film was also nominated for Best Set Design. Yeah, and they had this big, humongous space battle, which I've heard that originally that they were going to do this for Next Generation. They really wanted to do this for Best of Worlds Part 2 when they had the Battle of Wolf 359. But here's the thing. The reason why they didn't do it, because they had no money. That's basically why they couldn't do it. But since this is done in a film, they have plenty of money to do a big, big humongous action sequence in this film. You also see the Defiant in its only film appearance. Yep. And who's the command of it? Worf. As what the heck, Cisco and the rest of DS9 cast up to? Yeah, this is during a period of time when Worf was on DS9. And because of him being the strategic officer for Bajor... Whenever Cisco wasn't around, he's allowed the command to find do whatever the heck he wants. And what does he do? Take out the combat, beat the crap out of the Borg cube. And it's probably the only ship that was actually competent at actually firing at weapons. All our ships are like heavily damaged. And of course, Picard basically like And of course it's an awesome moment where the helm's basically like, there's no strikes that's coming in. And it's the Enterprise. And I'm sure that Warks Express is like, about damn time. And of course, with shields up anyways. 
and he could check like, oh, tell him about the life support feeling. And and here Picard's like, bridge transformer room three, being the finest survivors aboard, despite the fact the shields are up. Yeah, that that that's a common recurring plot hole when it comes to shields and transporters, where they can beam directly to the shields, despite the fact they really can't. Yeah, this is all something that you did on Next Generation frequently, where, oh, the shields are up, but they can still beam directly to the shield, even though they can't actually do that. Yeah, it's a it's a plot hole that is reoccurring. It's been there since Next Generation. It's not been a really big problem with the original series, per se, but it was a big problem Next Generation. Yeah. And, of course, what comes to the bridge? <laughs> and, of course, there's a hilarious line when what comes to the bridge my record's like, you do remember fire weapons, don't you? <laughs> right, Wolf just glares at him. <laughs> and apparently in the comic adaptation, it's like, is it the green button? <laughs> it's so funny. Absolutely so hilarious. And eventually, like, Picard takes command because the Admiral ship was destroyed. So he orders all the sh He said, like, I'm taking... Like, open channel, This is Captain Picard, I'm taking command of the fleet. All, wep all weapons target this particular portion of the board cube. Fire on my command. And of course, Data points out this is not a viable system. It's like, trust me, Data. So he's very explaining and says, one word, fire. Not like screaming like, like Kirk did in the two films back. Or at least over, like, hamming it up. And like, every single ship just fires like crazy. Like, firing phasers, torpedoes. They throw like everything at this cube. And then gets destroyed. But before it's destroyed, a spear pops up. Yep, first time the spear is actually making an appearance. Yes, the spear, the, the Borg spear would also make an appearance frequently on Voyage, but this technically is his first canon appearance. Yep, and it goes back in time. Now, I now uh, let me before I get to where it actually ends up. There was actually plans, believe it or not, one of the one of the script plans was to have this thing up with a freaking Renaissance and having Bakar taking lessons from Leonardo da Vinci. That would have been interesting too. And also, like on the planet itself, that originally that um Bakar was given the planet and Riker was gonna shift fighting the like fighting the Borg. But Stewart's like, no, I wanna fight the Borg. Riker can stay in the freaking planet. They go to past. Past. Where do they go? 2063. When it, this film came out in, in 1996. Basically, this film jumped ahead about oh, about 70 years. Yeah, as of right now, anyways, because it's now 2019, it is roughly like I think I'm trying to think. I think it's like uh oh, I'm trying to think here. I think it's like. About 44 years from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically, the Enterprise just basically went back, like, I think it was like 310 years. Yeah, about 310 years in the past. They destroyed a board cube pretty easily, while it's also destroy a, a compound in Montana, of all places. And this is where we get introduced to Zephyr and Cochran, the guy who invented the warp drive. Well, the first thing for one, of course, is, well, his friend Lily, played by... I think what was her name? Yeah, there's actually a good backstory that Jonathan Frankie says in the Alfred Wood Woodard. Yes, she. I heard about this on the commentary, which I've been trying to find this commentary. This is a very good commentary. Yeah, Frankie says the whole commentary, and he is by far like so interesting to listen to on the commentary because he learns so many things. Because in this commentary, you find out that Patrick Stewart is a trained boxer. The actress plays Lily as Frankie's godmother because she asked if he had godmother. He said no. Yeah, and mentioned by James Cromwell being nominated for LA, LA Confidential. Now, James Cromwell, this is his second time he's been in Star Trek. The last time was actually an episode of Next Generation where he played some prime minister of some alien planet who apparently wanted to hide its, its soldiers come back from war who were trained to kill and, like... Yeah, he bears his one appearance. Now, aside from this film, the only other films I've seen James Cromwell in was an iRobot and Babe and Babe Pig in the City. Two films, two of these films directed by the director of Mad Max, George Miller. Mm -hmm. Yep. Go to that planet. 
They find the Phoenix, that's the name of the ship. And I should point out, though, this was an actual Titan missile. Like, the whole thing of them being near like what looked like a missile, this is actually really real. And the shot would have, like, above the actual missile itself, what I heard, that was actually, believe it or not, a, a camera on a freaking crane. Yes, that was a crane camera going on top of that particular th ship. I thought a missile, and apparently a thing like radiation. Like, it's not like there was casualties. The ship itself, when they describe it, it looked like this guy got minor damage from the spear. And, like, Data, of course, like, of course, Lily decided to take her gun out. This is, of course, like, they mentioned, like, all these factions going around. It's like, like, they, they think it's someone called Ika. And, of course, Picard is like, I'm not a member of the East Coal, like, but I mentioned Lily, I'm not a member of the East of Coalition. Yeah. So, they, Lily gets sort of knocked up because stuff from radiation poisoning. Apparently, Data somehow got, even as a freaking android. Yeah, he jumps down. Like, first they're shot at, and... Data basically, obviously, is is the best choice to handle this because he's a robot. He can take bullets. <laughs> I think he just shot both of his back and his chest. And he says the he says Lily greetings. This is by far his only on screen encounter with Lily. The whole film. She does that brief encounter with Doctor Crush, but the rest of the film, it's all with Picard. The whole film. And of course, he get knocked out. Of course, a woman gets beaten on board. And of course, Wolf is at the command. Why not? And, like, Bakari says something's wrong. Goes, being able to say, like, Warf, is everything right over there? Yeah. Well, it's contact with Deck 16, which basically where the engineering is. And, like, temperature's up 10 degrees. And it's like, the day that I return to the ship, he says, understood, comes on board. And slowly throughout the whole film, Bakari's basically losing his uniform, top of his uniform. Where it's basically switched from the long sleeves to the vest. Yeah, it's basically because ship is basically getting hotter. So that's basically the reason. You see, you actually see Patrick Stewart's muscles in this particular film. Yeah, that's why he looks so beefy in this film because he's a trained boxer. And of course, War points that he might get one or two shots before basically start adapting. <laughs> and they have a couple of drones walk by. And Picard is like, lower your weapons. Don't say, don't ignore us so serious a threat. They can easily see you. And I thought this was so funny. Like, okay. <laughs> okay, they, they get to, they pretty much get to engineering like, no problem. Like, they get there, it's like, maybe over like, and, it, and Dave pulls the whole thing, I was like, and Picard is like, Maybe we should knock. <laughs> and that's when all the board wake up. And everything goes freaking nuts. Yeah. Everything like, it's, it becomes like a shooting frenzy. And like Warf's like, okay. Like apparently my gun's like over. So I'm like, I'm going I'm to basically take this thing. Use it as a freaking baseball bat. And basically use it to beat the crap on the board. And Data basically picks up a board. And throws it a bunch of them. Knocking them over like the freaking bowling pins. It's one of those... Hilarious and best action sequence of the whole film. And of course, then he gets captured very silly by just happily standing in front of a door. Yeah, he gets pulled like right underneath. And they all escape. And of course, prior to all this happening, we have like Lily basically in sick bay. And it was like him banging the door. And of course, like, evacuate anybody. And then, and Dr. Rush, I swear we use one of these things. And he says, Compu and she says, computer, activate the emergency medical hologram. And Robert Picardo shows up in the film. Yeah, one of two Star Trek Voyager cameos in this film. Yep, shows up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's like, and of course, he has the whole doc mode. I'm not, I'm a doc now, doors type. He's like, can you delay, can you delay, and you need you just to uh, slow them down. <laughs> and of course, the board can't simply have a freaking hologram as of what happens to this image. Never revealed. It's the only time, and it's also by far the only time you see Robert Ricardo wearing the current uniform, as opposed to the Voyage uniform that he was wearing later on. They were in the show, though. In the books, he does change uniforms once he comes to Earth. When, when Voyager comes home. Yep. So yeah, and of course, Bakar runs to Lily, knocks him in his hand, and of course shows him the uh, like, like tell him to get out of there. And of course, he opens up the window, and bam, like there's Earth. Yeah, he points out various countries, which mostly it's pretty accurate what he says. It's my time we up soon. But it's a long way down. He's like, he's like, no glass. And he touches like force field. 
I never seen that technology before because they haven't invented it. And of course, he tells him she tells him pretty much everything. And of course, she asks like, how big is the ship? Like over twenty four decks. Yeah, they're very inaccurate. And of course, they was wandering on the ship. I'm like, I'm like, where the heck are they? Are they on the bottom of the ship? Yeah, they look. It looks like the room they happen to wander in. It looks like a theater. With the way some of the air, with these handrails are here, ask where the heck this is. They don't really explain. It's like some random corridor, and then suddenly they ran into two Borg drones. Picard just shoots out a wall with Borg conduits, and just goes in the frick, goes in the holodeck, and just activates a Dixon Hill program. Yeah, anybody remember watch next next race? Remember these? And they all just ma he just magically puts on the clothes, even though that previously shown in the show he had to wear the clothes before he go in. My guess is they must have changed it with this ship because he literally basically wearing a dress and Picard ba wearing a white dinner jacket and a suit. And of course they're dancing and say Nicky the Nose, like first they Nicky the Nose, like like wrong chapter. And of course they get to the right place. It's like computer activate chapter thirteen. And of course they jump ahead and they run Nicky the Nose. It's like. And you can sort of pat down, of course, you see the Borg Jones. You see Ethan Phillips. The only time you see Ethan Phillips ever in Star Trek without makeup as Neelix. Like, he gets scanned, he gets thrown, like, thrown to the side. And then Picard picks up a case that happens contains a Tommy gun, picks it up, and shoots the Borg with bullets. I'm like, why did you do this? Why did you use freaking phasers? Why didn't you use freaking bullets? And it looks like he's having fun. And he's about to basically just about to whack him with the butt of the gun. And then it's like, Lou's like, okay, you got them. And he opens the thing looking for a particular transceiver. He finds it. It's like, okay, he finds out what the plan is. The the communication array, the contact board of the 20th first century, which is in Delta Quadrant, obviously. So Picard, Worf, and Hawking, Lieutenant Hawk, now, those of you who see this film, like, you recognize that, like, wait, this act looks familiar. Wasn't he an arrow playing Damien Dark? Yes, this is the same act that played Damien Dark, and also who played Dumb Dumb Duke from Captain America First Avenger and Agent Carter. Same actor. He also was in the film Timeline. Yep. He actually, he's actually the only named character in the film who's not the next generation cast, Lily, or Zephyr Cochran. Yeah, he's the only Starfleet officer who's named in the film. He appears roughly a few times the course of the film. One point, Data locks the computer once to get to Earth because of all they try to log into him. And of course, Data himself basically gets sort of seduced by the Queen in the most hilarious way, po like interesting possible. Like first, she somehow grafts human skin onto his scalp on his middle body, somehow scrapes him, like he has scraped out Borg, and he starts making out with her. Yep. And next time we see Data in the engineering, his face is like cover is like um like removed and replaced with like regular skin. Yep. Yeah, and then where's it he's layers when well they gave up basically everything. Mm-hmm. I'll be right back for part two of this, okay? Put you two there. Bye.